This is episode eight of the Heart Body Business Podcast. And in numerology, the number eight is related to flowing abundance in all areas of life, but especially in relation to career, business, and finance. It's the money number, which is why I've decided to dedicate this episode to the theme of money, specifically the wisdom of money in life and business with thoughts on what it is, how to attract more, and how to use it in a way that genuinely fulfills us. This episode is packed with humor, insights, and practical steps with quotes from some of the world's great thinkers. So buckle up. We're going to have fun. We're going to align our values with our actions, and we're going to get ourselves set to make some money. This is the Heart Body Business Podcast, inspiration, tips, and tools for entrepreneurs seeking a more fulfilling type of success, one that stems from exploring and expressing their true passion and purpose and finding healthy ways to do so, all coupled with insights and action items to get a business moving in the right direction. I'm Steve, your host, and I invite you to learn more at heartbodybusiness.com. Let's start by remembering that money is nothing more than a way of trading our goods and services. At its root, it's a better system than bartering, as it allows for much more nuanced trading and doesn't require someone who buys from you to have a product or service you need in return. You just take some money and you're able to go somewhere else to buy what you're looking for. Granted, in times of financial collapse, if no one trusts whatever currency is available, Uh, they can revert to bartering. It's just a lot harder to do. That said, I'm sure some people love the idea of bartering for the same reason that governments hate it. It's tough to monitor and tax. And taken to its extreme, if everyone bartered and no one used dollars, that would mean no money for the government unless people were reporting their trades. And it's a weird situation. If you trade a cow for dollars, you have earned income from the cow and pay income tax on it. But the buyer, even though he's received a cow for his money, he has received value. He is not considered to have earned a value that he's taxed on. Only the seller pays income tax, right? In bartering, if someone trades you two goats for the cow, You've been paid in goats, but the goats have some dollar value. That is income, and legally speaking, you should be paying income tax on it. That's fine. That's the same as if you'd sold it for money. But wait, the person selling goats has also received value for his goats. He received a cow. So at least in the U.S., he's also meant to pay income tax. In other words... When you pay in dollars, there is only one seller and one person pays an income tax. But in barter, there are apparently, and magically, two sellers who must both pay income tax for the privilege of making what they feel is an equal trade. In other words, they don't feel they've increased their wealth, but the government sure does. Now that said, since this is a podcast for entrepreneurs, I'll point out that wealth and success take different forms. It's not always about dollars. My first freelancing project many years ago was the copy editing of a website that sold water filtration systems, and I received a reverse osmosis system in exchange. It's something I wanted and couldn't afford at that point in my career. So I feel legitimately increased my wealth or my quality of life, which is how I would really describe wealth. Reviewers often receive free products and travel bloggers receive free places to stay, but not really free. They're doing something in exchange, but their lives are better for it. So when we're talking about money, let's remember that this could take the form of bartering in some cases, whether just to get you going or whether it's a regular part of your business. Just keep in mind, if you're wanting to be on the safe side of the law, make sure you track the value you receive and render unto Caesar what is his. 
Historically, precious metals came to be used as coins so people could go beyond the bartering system. By using something rare, someone couldn't magically make a bunch of it appear and throw chaos into the system. So gold coins, for instance, would need a certain weight of gold to have a certain tradable value in Rome, but this was watered down by the rulers over time. They made it so coins with less gold in them were worth the same amount. This was, in effect, the government's way of printing money and driving inflation. This is the tactic of every government that wants to buy power at the expense of those who have any type of savings. In case you're not clear how that works, imagine you have $100,000 in the bank, but the government doubles the money supply without doubling available products and services. Since, after all, the government cannot double the products and services available, So now people have more money to spend, so they want to buy more. This raises demand for products and services. When demand goes up, prices go up. So now your $100,000 cannot buy as much. You have literally lost wealth by putting money into savings. It is a hidden tax, and it's a tax on those who are responsible enough to save money for the future. It is a way for the government to have more money to spend relative to everyone else, thus giving it the ability to pay for projects, which is to say, purchase influence. But this is nothing new in the history of government. When Yogi Berra humorously quipped, a nickel ain't worth a dime anymore, he was spelling out the problem of inflation. Now, by the way, let's point out something fascinating. Since the government has an automated way to tax us like this, in theory, they could get rid of the income tax and simply inflate the money supply each year. I'm not saying they should, but I'm saying they could. And by definition, they'd be taxing savings, which means it's kind of a progressive tax, which so many people think we should have. The poor would pay almost nothing in this way because they have very little in savings. Obviously, there are plenty of loopholes here. The wealthy could keep most of their wealth in investments, which would be driven up with inflation, and perhaps the middle class would be stuck with the brunt of things. This would, however, eliminate countless wasted hours of retaining paperwork and filing taxes and money spent on accountants. So even if we were effectively taxed just as much as we are today, it would be a huge savings for us. But guess what? It would also eliminate an incredibly complex tax code that can be weaponized by the government when they want to. It would also eliminate one way to track where your money is moving. But of course, these days, they're looking at implementing a fully digital currency that can absolutely track everything about your money. And in promoting such a currency, they could tout the end to income tax filing, as they could automate the filing process and simply take your money, probably making it difficult to dispute whatever you consider to be an error. But we shall see. By the way, if you're interested in cryptocurrencies and the inherent dangers in governments controlling them, you might check out YouTube sometime and look up cryptocurrency poem, What the Common People Choose. I wrote and performed this back in 2017. One point made in the poem is the fact that if the government digitally controls a currency, they also have the ability to shut you out of your savings altogether. In fact, in this time of modern censorship, they've already done this to individuals both in Canada and the U.S. This obviously gets political, but you can't really talk about money without getting political, which means you can't think about starting and running a successful business without at least understanding the political landscape and adapting to it. Suffice it to say, I encourage you to be aware that this sort of financial censorship is happening and the government is moving toward a digital currency. Awareness gives you more power in your plans. Now, This problem of inflation is exactly why a lot of people like the idea of backing paper currencies with precious metals. 
just as we used to do. As I said, even gold coins got watered down in the past. But if you were locked to a specific amount per dollar indefinitely, there would be no way to inflate the money supply beyond the mining of new metals. So the supply could grow, but slowly. If you're interested in this topic, you might like to know about gold backs. Look them up online. They found a way to etch specific weights of gold into beautiful looking currency. Each denomination simply is a fraction of an ounce of gold. So you're absolutely locked here to the value and availability of gold. This is not necessarily legal tender, or at least at the federal level, but if ever needed, something like this would provide a means of trade with a reliable currency. A big problem with gold historically is that it's worth too much for buying a loaf of bread. Silver coins are better for day-to-day purchases. But with gold backs, denominations can be small enough for those purchases and at less weight than carrying around silver. So this is an interesting new prospect, and several states have produced these. All this said, I do believe in savings, personally and within your business. You want liquidity so you can weather the various ups and downs of an economy, and so you can invest in new opportunities to grow your business. Businesses with healthy cash reserves can often step on the gas when others are laying off workers in an economic downturn, and they can gain in market share. You can also get a lot more for your money when people are scrambling for cash. But I don't believe in putting all your eggs in one basket. If you keep everything in cash and the value of cash collapses, what are you left with? This is the wisdom of diversification. Real estate is something that doesn't just disappear even if its value goes down. Although granted, you may have to constantly pay taxes on it. Gold and silver have huge increases in value at times, huge drops in value at other times, and are stagnant over long periods as well. They might not be the best option for accumulating wealth if the economy is strong, but they could be a good backup in times of real need. A lot of people invest in cryptocurrency, either in hopes of huge increases in value or as a way to get off the grid, so to speak. Again, digital currency is a huge topic. Governments are implementing these, so it's hard to know what they'll do about those currencies they don't control. But be aware that crypto isn't just a digital way to trade value. Blockchain technology has real-world value. It may power the next version of the internet in a way that cannot be censored, for instance. So, for what it's worth... Some crypto is more than just a digital dollar that you hope will be perceived as having value. That said, using crypto is not yet entirely user-friendly for a lot of people, and it relies on electricity and internet access to use, something that cash, gold and silver coins, gold backs, etc. don't need. You can, of course, invest in stocks and bonds. You can invest in startups through sites like WeFunder and StartEngine. You can invest in upgrades to your home. In other words, there are plenty of ways to diversify. I'm not an investment advisor, of course, and many, if not all of these, could have tax implications, so it can be useful to speak with an accountant. But these are things to consider when you have enough cash reserves. Of course, as entrepreneurs, we should make sure we're investing plenty in our own businesses before we think about investing in stocks or startups. So how do we go about growing a business to the point that how we invest our cash is a good problem to have? Well, Malcolm Forbes gave us one idea. I made my money the old-fashioned way, he said. I was very nice to a wealthy relative right before he died. Okay, so this is great for the likes of Malcolm Forbes. But for the rest of us, when we follow the heart-body business model, we start inside the heart. That is, what is your individual purpose on earth? What are you here to do? And how can you apply your talents to achieve that? Julia Cameron, author of The Artist's Way, wrote, What we really want to do is what we are really meant to do. When we do what we are meant to do, money comes to us, doors open for us, 
we feel useful, and the work we do feels like play to us. This is what I mean when I talk about restoring our passion for business. All of us love to play. We just might think of play in different ways, but it is, by definition, what we enjoy, what excites us, and what restores our energy. If you've lost energy around your business, the problem is not pursuing what you feel you were built for. So, what were you built for? As Maya Angelou said, you can only become truly accomplished at something you love. Don't make money your goal. Instead, pursue the things you love doing and then do them so well that people can't take their eyes off you. Absolutely. We have the chance to be stellar, but only in areas where our genius lies. We have to dive inside ourselves and find this, and then align ourselves with our businesses in a way that lets us express this. The takeaway is to definitely reflect on this and change things up if your business currently drains you rather than charging you. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, Money often costs too much. It does so when we do not love what's involved in obtaining it. It sucks away our soul and our time to do what we're here for. As much as possible, we need to avoid this fate. Once we understand our purpose, we need to believe we have value and what we offer has value so we can charge accordingly. I remember as a kid hating the song, The Greatest Love, implying that loving oneself is the greatest love. I knew this was nonsense. We have to love others. But growing up, I came to realize how many people struggle with self-love. And when they do, they really don't have a foundation for loving others. They don't know how it's done. If you struggle with this, I encourage you to surround yourself with those who see your purpose and your talents and avoid the naysayers. Unless you're so confident in yourself that it doesn't matter what others say, this is important to your success. This doesn't mean you can't have people who are honest with you and help to steer you, but they should do so with love and while offering solutions rather than just focusing on why you cannot succeed. This is big. When you believe in your value, you can charge for your value. You understand this is what it takes to build and maintain a healthy business, which allows you to continue offering what is yours to share with the world. After all, we've always lived in a world of economics, charging for our talents, even before modern economies. We hunted for a woolly mammoth while others cared for the homestead, gathered water, or whatever. Again, money just gives us a more nuanced way of exchanging the value we have to give. We can certainly still help the people around us with our talents if and when we want without cost. We can give our time to nonprofits or things we believe in. But in my mind, this should only be done for those who recognize and are grateful for the value. So what is your value? If you want to share it and how you're expressing it through business and even include a link to your business, I've included a page for you to do this. Visit heartbodybusiness.com and look in the drop-down navigation under podcast you'll see a page called Your Unique Purpose, and I'd love to hear from you about this. Ayn Rand once said, the question isn't who is going to let me, it's who is going to stop me. By believing in yourself, you can make sure you're not the one stopping yourself. Now, this doesn't mean we should offer our talents for a love of money, but for a love of ourselves and others. We do this by coming from the heart, something our heart-body business community is meant to be practicing. As Jonathan Swift said, a wise person should have money in their head, but not in their heart. In the last episode, we talked about the brain as a limitless tool, but one that needs to be directed by the heart. The heart is an attractive force in linking us to others, which can only happen when we are extended to the world. When our focus is on money for ourselves, we block that extension. We disconnect. 
I've said before that the energy of creation is only available in the present moment because the present moment is all that exists. Most of us have very little of ourselves in the present moment, so we limit our success. By expressing joy, gratitude, and love from the heart, we move into our power. Entrepreneur, economist, and business theorist Roger Babson once said, Let him who would enjoy a good future waste none of his present. In our success model, I talk about the brain connecting us to the future. It visualizes where we're going and helps us to get there, but it needs the energy and genius of the heart to move it into action. For this reason, we cannot neglect a lifetime of learning. We need to train the mind to give us more possibilities, and we can never stop with conventional schooling. Formal education will make you a living, said Jim Rohn, but self-education will make you a fortune. So combining these ideas, we have the words of Norman Vincent Peale. Empty pockets never held anyone back. Only empty heads and empty hearts can do that. As we come into a place of financial success, we then have to think about our relationship to that money and our use of it. Steve Martin's ludicrous humor makes the point. I love money, he said. I love everything about it. I bought some pretty good stuff. Got me a $300 pair of socks, got a fur sink, an electric dog polisher, a gasoline-powered turtleneck sweater, and, of course, I bought some dumb stuff, too. Everyone values different things, and they'll use their money differently. But one thing is sure. If you buy a lot of stuff, you may find yourself owned by it. Surround yourself with things you use. Surround yourself with beauty, if you wish. And invest, as we discussed before. But do not spend on clutter. This will own a part of your mind. As Will Rogers once said, too many people spend money they earned to buy things they don't want to impress people that they don't like. Don't be too many people. Be you, buying and investing in what is right for you. It's good to have money and the things that money can buy, said George Lorimer, but it's good, too, to check up once in a while and make sure that you haven't lost the things that money can't buy. An excellent point. Time, health, and relationships are perhaps the most valuable things on earth. Exactly why I talk about all three ahead of business success and as important elements behind business success. In the end, P.T. Barnum said it well when he said, Money is a terrible master but an excellent servant. This is again because money is a tool, just as the mind is. Both must be controlled through the heart, or else they're controlled by the gut, by our fears and survival instincts. And in those cases, money becomes the master, and it's a fearsome master indeed. Much of the pain on this planet comes of those who appear wealthy, but are in fact controlled by wealth. They are victims of an underlying fear. Wealth isn't about some banking ledger. It's about how much we value our lives. As Henry David Thoreau said, wealth is the ability to fully experience life. And as someone unknown said, the real measure of your wealth is how much you'd be worth if you lost all your money. This, you see, leaves us with love and relationships, education and talents, and our health, the things that matter, the things from which we can rebuild. They say that time is money, but this isn't true. Until we've conquered death, time on this planet is limited. Money is not. So time is far more than money. What you genuinely value, then, is where you put your time. Then, where you put your money, which is an extension of your time. Reflect on what matters most to you, and then see where your time and money are going, 
and see if these align. If they don't, ask yourself whether you're mistaken about what matters or you're mistaken about how you're investing in your life. Until these align, something is wrong and you're not pursuing the life that you really hold dear. My pull is for you, for you to know your purpose and to share it successfully with the world to make money, but more important, to build real wealth, to experience the most important things in life. And by that, I mean the most important things to you. It's your journey on this planet and you get to choose. Till next time, thanks for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe. You can also join our mailing list to get alerts on our latest episodes and other tips, tools, and news. Learn more and sign up at heartbodybusiness.com.